There is so much shame. It feels especially now that you're in mom land, you think, oh great, I've got to have my act together because I need to be able to teach it to this little person. Welcome to the Unapparent Podcast, the place that delivers deeply human stories about the unapparent truths of parenting. My name is Katia Rayero Lindor, and I am your host. Join us as we debunk myths surrounding parenthood and provide an empathetic, judgment-free space for parents and parents to be. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Today we have another special guest, my therapist, Mindy Bales. Mindy works as a licensed mental health counselor and supervisor in Orlando, Florida with clients from all walks of life and specializes in anxiety and trauma, postpartum issues, and marital slash premarital therapy. Her greatest joy is being a wife to her husband, Josh, and mother to their two vivacious daughters, Daphne and Lucy. Mindy, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, so happy to be here. So there's so much that we could discuss, um, but I wanna make sure we have um, time to discuss a lot of the the topics that I'm interested in, in um, just bringing forth. But before we get into the nitty gritty, um, just a little background for my listeners on how Mindy and I connected. Um, I was about one month postpartum and having a very difficult time with this stage. You know, my postpartum depression, what I came to realize is what I had. Um, was pretty rough, and I think that happens to a lot of women. Maybe more than, you know, talk about. Um, So my emotions were all over the place, um, which is normal, you know, hormones are still regulating at that time. Um, But I had absolutely no way to prepare for how difficult this stage um, was. So my midwives connected me with Mindy. And um, at first it started as couples therapy with um, my husband, and then it progressed into individual therapy and occasional couples therapy Um, and I cannot stress enough how much these sessions really helped me. They were weekly sessions and I came to just look forward to them Um, and Mindy helped me with all aspects of my life not just postpartum and parenting Um, and one of those particular aspects was discovering or rather confirming something I always suspected which is that I have ADHD. Um, When I was about 13, I asked my mom to take me to a psychiatrist to have me diagnosed. She did, but to no avail. I think back then in Puerto Rico, especially um, where I lived, there was very little knowledge uh, surrounding ADHD. And um, I was told that there was no way I could have it because I was highly functioning, bright, and I followed conversations with ease. Um, And so for those of you who don't know, ADHD presents itself differently in different people. Um, So these traits, I think, are misconceived generalizations of what ADHD is. So now I will pass the mic to Mindy um, so that Mindy can tell us a little bit more about what ADHD is and the various ways it can present itself in different individuals. Yeah. So thanks so much for sharing a little bit about our story. Um, A fun fact is the um, midwives that connected us were actually, I used the same midwife for my own uh, home births. So uh, that was really fun. And yeah, I get to um, meet a lot of moms in that postpartum season. And it's so raw. uh, So many different things are able to present themselves. But um, it wasn't long after working with you that we were able to just really discover some of the um, really common ways that adults specifically, which will be very distinct from children, struggle with ADHD. And one fact that I will point out is um, for moms, and this is the reason why I feel like this particular population is Um, It's so precious, really, um, but also why it's almost seeming like it's sort of burgeoning in our awareness is because, like you, Katia, a lot of us are very highly functioning people, you know, and our brain is going to do its best to um, create workarounds for our deficiencies. So we're going to 
try to set up our lives to succeed, basically, in the areas where we can succeed and avoid those things that are really challenging. So organization, executive function, long-term commitment, you know, we find our way around some of those issues. And it usually works well enough until we become parents. And now the onslaught of the timing of feedings, the preparation of food, the changing of diapers before they're bursting with crystals, you know, and all of the things that just make it so much more organizationally challenging and that typically do fall to the mother, you know, whatever primary caregiver, um, all of a sudden it exposes this inability to cope. Um, and so there are different schools of thoughts on this and, and we can, you know, see how far you want to take this, but um, the three primary types of uh, ADHD are inattentive, hyperactive, or the combined, which is the more classic ADHD. And so some people say, well, I can't be, um, I can't have ADHD because I can sit still. You know, I don't, I don't have problems with, you know, staying in my chair or even following a conversation necessarily. But if there is something that you are interested in, well, then you will be very attentive, right? And even with focus, you will, if you are very interested, you will not only focus, you will have hyper focus because that's one of sort of the magic gifts of ADHD. Um, so it can look so many different ways. Um, I will tell you there is a school of thought um, that there are seven subtypes of ADHD. And some people really, that's, and that's not um, clinically significant and that that's not recognized by the, the DSM, our um, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, um, but it's recognized enough that people find it interesting to help sort of curate treatment options for that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think for me, as you say, becoming a mom just exposes so much of mm -hmm. me, um, you know, my my limitations, my setbacks, um, more so than before. Um, obviously, um, I was, I think I, I said in my, in my last episode that being a, being a mom really exposed just my anxieties, my fears, just so much mm. more at a heightened level than previously. Um, and same with, I mean, there's a reason I think I really discovered that I have ADHD as an adult after being a mom, <laughs> because even mm. though I suspected it from when I was a child, um, not because I was hyperactive and not because I, you know, couldn't like sit still or um, concentrate on X or Y activity. Um, it was because um, I, I could totally tell that if I didn't have that dopamine that I really needed to like do something, it was so hard for me to do it just something wasn't gonna like happen. No. Mm. And, and, I, you know, I was, you know, socialized to believe that that was just laziness. And I knew I wasn't lazy, you know. I knew that mm -hmm. I could practice three hours a day, you know, the violin if if I wanted to. You know, if I had a drive, if I knew, like, I had a recital coming up or a concert or I just really wanted to impress my teacher that week, I mm -hmm. could sit in a room and practice my butt off. And same with, you know, working out. I could work out for hours if I wanted to or a really focused 45-minute workout and you know, I, I knew that for the things that really excited something in me, I could do that. Mm. And same with like reading. I could read a whole Harry Potter book in three days. And those are like 900 mm. pages. You know, mm -hmm. now it seems like I can't even finish a book cover to cover. And obviously, mm. you know, mom <laughs> things come into play. Like I, I'm a little busier than I was before. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm like, man, if anything, it's only been exacerbated, you know, and the organization has always been sort of like an issue in my life, according to my mom. And really, yeah, it's not I'm not the most like organized person. Like uh, it, I would see some of my friends that would just get such a high from rearranging their room and like, oh, I'm going to like, you know, fold my clothes and put them here. And like I could tell that that was something they enjoyed. And I was just like, that yes. sounds horrible. <laughs> Isn't that the difference? You can sense that level of like enthusiasm. If they're not doing a chore that they ought to be doing, there's an actual enthusiasm. This is going to do something for me if I do this. Playing the violin did something for you. It currently does something for you. So you can get behind that. But being able to tap into that dopamine resource when it's not there, well, who else feels like they can just create their own neurochemistry? No, no one believes that in any other facet of life. 
But here we tend to, and we have shamed ourselves, you know, into thinking, oh, well, that's just, you know, I need to create a Pinterest worthy room because that's what I ought to be doing. Right. And um, that's just, I think it's just added so much to that imposter syndrome that I've talked about and feeling like, you know, as a mom, maybe I'm not, you know, competent enough because of all of these, you know, what society would deem lax and I guess my, my brain. Um, and it's just uh, parenting with ADHD is, I guess, a lot more difficult um, mm-hmm. than um, before. I mean, than I would have, you know, realized because mm-hmm. I, first of all, <laughs> didn't have validation for, for something I intuitively knew. Um, and so it was really hard for me to like wrap my head around, like, why can't I just, you know, like do this or that? Like, I know I have to do it. I know it's a chore and I, and I, it, it gets done eventually, but mm-hmm. there's a lot of like going around, like having to do it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's always in my mind been like a, a point of like shame because I'm like, well, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not a functioning adult really then if I can't, you know, do these basic chores, Yeah, absolutely. There is so much shame. It feels especially now that you're in mom land, you think, oh, great, I've got to have my act together because I need to be able to teach it to this little person, you know? And so then there's fear and then, okay, all of these false starts of, well, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to begin to operate in life with a level of discipline and uh, self-control and will that I've never had before, but somehow I'm going to muster it now, you know? So we have all these false starts. We don't follow through with them. The laundry still sits either unwashed or souring in the, you know, machine or unfolded or whatever stage it is, because do we care about our children being clothed? Yes. But do we care about laundry? No. And so being able to figure out the kind of workarounds to say, man, life just got so much more exciting in the sense that I have all of these huge things that I love and I'm interested in and I want to take my baby here and all of these things that I just love so much. So an incredible infusion of dopamine and also, oops, I spent most of the day on the couch, you know, tickling her toes and and staring at her and realized that not anything else has been done. Now I have to figure out, you know, this balance, but taking away the ingredient of shame. Wow. What a game changer right? Because if you didn't have to think, I feel badly about that, but rather I'm an incredibly creative person. I'm an incredibly um, like intuitive and also impulsive. You know, we're going to need to talk about that piece too. How can I put those facets together to work for me to create a new situation here that works for my particular family culture? And also, and this I think is really noteworthy for us to remember, um, the genetic component to ADHD is nothing to smack at. So at least we're at about 50% right now, what we know, you know, kind of in research, um, if the parent has it, um, one or more, 50% of the children are likely to have it. So now I think, okay, how can you use that impetus to say, how do I want to present this diagnosis to my child? How do I want in the event that he or she is going to, you know, struggle in the same way? How do we take that creative approach, you know, to make this workable for them so that they don't get the label that I have struggled with and still struggle with? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's a, a great point. Um, I hadn't even thought that far because, again, I, I guess I'm stuck in that like notion that it can present itself in ways that could be obvious, whereas I went my whole life, 27 years without anyone ever assuming or thinking that I had ADHD, you know, except myself. And so with Kalina, for example, I mean, she's so bright and so smart. And then all the things that people thought of me, they're like, there's no way. Um, And she's creative, but I do see that she loves like picking up like she loves throwing things in the trash and she'll tell me mama like move that there you know so I'm like "Eh, maybe she doesn't take after me after all (laughs) maybe she's very organized maybe she'll be the Uh, one to like teach me a little organization in my life um my mom tried it yeah I mean she thinks she failed so um it was just very hard um yeah she needed to like come up with little math songs and games for me to like learn my Mm -hmm. tables just because math was zero percent of my interest you know with Mm -hmm. English and history and other subjects that I like really liked 
I was just like, I thrived at that. But, you know, I would always mm-hmm. leave math for like last. And since I was homeschooled, mm-hmm. my mom um, was my teacher for a lot, a lot of my life. Um, and, oh, man, I admire her because I don't know how she how she did it. You know, forcing me to mm-hmm. do something I didn't want to do was for real, like a challenge. Um, yes. <clears throat> Were there any things in that? I'm curious. So this is probably more even personal for me. I'm um, homeschooling right now. My two uh, little uh, balls of energy. And um, and similarly to you, I've got one who is um, very, very obviously gifted, um, just an exceptional learner. But as I keep my eye on her, I definitely am observing some signs of just inherent ADHD, um, which those are really often highly correlated, you know, Um, and really wanting to kind of start some of those workarounds for her, you know, inspire. um, How can we creatively go after this? So something like math. Gosh, what a perfect example. It's like the adult expression of laundry, right? (laughs) Has to be done. There's really nothing exciting about it, but we have to learn it. We have to figure it out. Mm hmm. Yeah, my mom just tried to make it fun for me, you know, and mm. even though that to me is like an obvious sign, like, mom, I only do things that motivate me <laughs> with some like, like other reason, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. I don't I don't blame her. Like, there was not much knowledge surrounding it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it was that's how I got to and I learned them, you know, in, in song form and like game form. Um, songs help a lot you know like music is just it it helps incredibly um children especially but yeah that's how i learned and and i think um so your your husband has adhd right that's where your daughter might have yeah so i mean it's just um i (laughs) after you know my parents found out that um both my sister and i have it and it's and my sister is you know brilliant and she's just um just so in in all of our eyes so capable and able you know um and my parents themselves who are both you know attorneys they met in law school they're like which of us has probably both of us then you know they're Mm. they're like i don't Mm -hmm. think they've been able to like self-diagnose themselves yet but they i think they're like yeah we both must have it then or something i don't know Mm -hmm. but um it's 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 yeah it's interesting how like as adults mm -hmm. is when we realize these things Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so much for like temperament and personality in kids that you think, you know, well, every kid has trouble sitting at the table at your meal. Well, some kids have trouble and they're learning it. And some kids feel like it's actual torture, you know, and it's hard for, I think, parents to even be able to distinguish the difference there. Um, Yeah. My husband um, is diagnosed um, and I would say his is, is pretty severe. Um, we tend to move toward kind of more spectrum diagnoses. So like you have this, how severe, you know, on the spectrum are you? I am diagnosed as well. I'm just a little bit lower on the spectrum. And really interesting, Katya, I think this has a lot to do with um, kind of how we struggle differently. I really did not experience a lot of shame in my childhood as I struggled with this. It got passed off as sort of airheaded and flighty, but cute or charming. And because of the the creativity and kind of the bubbliness um, that was passed over. And I think it's really interesting to think about um, the weight of shame and how much more I would have identified with that, you know, versus I could just kind of see myself as, um, huh, I got to figure this organization thing out. You know, this is really tricky. I got to figure out these rhythms or, um, so there's a lighthearted approach um, that I think can be had, you know, as well. But really what, what you're talking about there with um, children, I think is so interesting because that's uh, really in our kind of treatment research right now. And gosh, especially for moms, this is the key to mom life kind of period, but especially with ADHD, it's rhythms and fun. So make it routine, make it some kind of rhythm so that you don't forget. So like you're saying kind of the music makes it fun, but you had to learn it. You had to practice over and over again your time tables. You can't learn them by any other way, just by practicing. Um, so make it into a rhythm or a routine and then make it a reward somehow. Um, you know, so for adults, you know, we each kind of come up with our own ways. I'm curious maybe about some of yours, but I know honestly something exactly like this, a podcast is my treat to exit the world. Mama's going to fold laundry. I'm going to put in these little AirPods and I am going to fold away and I'm not going to stop until the podcast is finished, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I've in the past have come to bring myself to do the chores that are not fun. You know, I'm 
listening to something, whether it's a podcast mm -hmm. or music or watching a you know a show or movie I like, you know, reading is a little harder when I need both hands to like read and yeah. pass the page. And um, but yeah, that's and that's how I've come to do things. You know, my whole life growing up, I need to have some additional um component that motivates me to be able to do then these chores. Um, and I I can imagine for people you know who may be listening who don't know anything about ADHD or have no or don't have it themselves and they're just like oh that just sounds like laziness to me mm -hmm. and I think that the reason I see that is because that's what was you know mm -hmm. just that's what I was told basically um mm -hmm. and it obviously it makes me feel like like my child makes is it's just my internal child just hurts hearing that because I know yeah. it's not true yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I could even feel that tenderness with you right now, you know, as we're talking. And yeah, it is so painful because children come in the world complete, right? They are who they are. And we are just unlocking all of that being, you know, that God has placed within them and releasing it out into the world. And when you're getting that message, you know, that no, something's wrong. You're, you're, you're doing this deficiently. You know, you need to do this differently. Um, it is, it's just, it's such a negative message. So being able to say, wow, you know what I see, it's neurodivergent, right? It's not neurotypical. You know, neurotypical, we can sort of parent in this one standard way. This is a neurodivergence, but being able to see that either in our kids or in ourselves and name that honestly. So, I mean, I've said this to you, you know, I think of uh, ADHD as kind of a, a creative powerhouse. Um, I think of my husband a lot because he is sort of like the supercharged creative person. And he can be up all into the wee hours, you know, of the night and the morning, um, hyper-focusing on something, but man, he produces, you know, he makes a lot of beautiful works of creativity. Um, and he's a mental health counselor as well. So, you know, you need quite a bit of attention to be able to, to stick with a, a conversation like that. But when you choose something that's in your wheelhouse, and now you've kind of, you've staffed to your weakness, you know, you can work with your own powerhouse of creativity um, to sort of stay, you know, in that flow, which is interesting because I think now that's what I see you doing, you know, behind mm -hmm. this podcast. This is like capture your imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, um, when I feel like really, really motivated about something, like I'm hyper focused on that, you know, mm -hmm. like, it's no, it's not um, like, oh, I have to do this, like, it's a chore, you know, it's like something that whether it requires hard work, or not, like, it's, 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 you know, it fills me. So mm -hmm. it's not I know I'm not lazy, because I can do the work, you know, and, and I can, I can really focus, you know, when it's something that really, um, just makes it I'm passionate about that's bottom mm -hmm. line if I'm if there's passion I can do it you know that's right yes and so I'm curious even to go back to that for a moment that sense of um kind of that deficiency in in childhood um I wonder if if that could have been um sort of recaptured you know like reimagined for you you know, and, and, and for any of us who are struggling, especially those who, like you say, don't really get it, they don't experience ADHD. And so they don't really understand, it seems like it might be a matter of willpower, you've just put your, you know, goodwill in the wrong direction. Um, I wonder if that could have been sort of recaptured as um, a chemical and neural difference, how that might would have played out differently for you and, and how it might would play out for us now in conversation, even like just to engender a lot more compassion, if if not even compassion, curiosity, you know, with those we're talking with, you know, what is this like for you? So I like to think of it as, um, so if there is a cortisol difference and dopamine difference in the ADHD brain, and there is mercifully, now we have PET scans, PET, PET scans rather, that will literally show you the areas of hyperactivity or inactivity or the lack of balance and communication in there. So it's a very verifiable thing, but you know, sadly we don't walk around with our, um, our brain scans to, to prove these things, right? <laughs> so the difference is if you had an insulin issue, you would not judge that as a matter of willpower. If you were a diabetic, you would say, my body doesn't regulate its own insulin correctly. So I therefore need to manually help it to regulate insulin. 
Same thing with the ADHD brain and dopamine. You've got to get in there and put that system, not on autopilot, but put it into manual mode so that you can regulate it, you know, so that we can regulate it. And that's such a more compassionate stance to say, oh, that's how someone, a mom, who loves her child and her life more than anything, is wanting to do everything the best that she can. She's having to really work harder than the rest of us to make all of this happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if if I had at any point in, you know, my life um, growing up heard that my brain just works a little differently, um, wow, that would have removed so much like shame from mm -hmm. how I felt, you know, about myself. Um, and even now, you know, it's it's since it's st still fairly new, like knowledge, um, uh, even though, you know, I deep down I, I knew but I didn't have any confirmation you know so I kind of felt like well I just must be like deficient in these ways um mm -hmm. and so that is it, it is a game changer having that you know validation that I'm I'm not all the things I was t taught to believe I was and um I'm actually you know very capable in spite of and despite you know um knowing like it didn't change anything in the sense that like well no, i still have to deal with it you know my life is i i, right. I still have to find ways to um mm -hmm. cope and, and and function and you know do things um that i m maybe don't want to do but find ways to do it but i think knowing that there's tools that i can equip myself with that you've helped me realize um mm -hmm. to make these things in my life you know happen mm -hmm. um has been a it has been a game changer for sure um so yeah i mean thank you for that and yeah. i think a lot of people maybe don't um speak, i think i don't know if it's specifically in women but there's so many people i've met recently that have been diagnosed as adults you know that mm. it's like oh and i'm just like wow how many people maybe go their whole lives without ever knowing it you know and ever knowing mm. there's ways you can equip yourself to you know to have a fulfilling life and not feel you know like oh i'm incapable of doing this or that you know it's just a matter yes. of figuring out how it works for you right no i know i i hurt for that so much it's i had mixed feelings because on one hand, yay, you know, finally a diagnosis, you know, which can begin hopefully to lead to, you know, a healthier struggle. But on the other hand, oh man, had this been identified so much younger, because so much of it is, is literally about training. You know, it's, hey, let's honor your particular brain and your particular way of being in the world. And really the practical is it's setting up scaffolding around that, you know? Okay, tell me your goals. Tell me what you need to get done. Tell me what you want to do. All right, we've got to set up some scaffolding around that to make that happen for you. So now, as an adult starting that process, it is that imposter syndrome. You know, you feel you feel embarrassed, and you don't really want to kind of show that part of you to the world. It feels like all of this like adulting, you know, that we're talking about right now. It feels really we're just really bad at it. You know, well, if you'd gotten started at a much younger age, how much more? Um, would you have learned to kind of lean into that? Oh, okay, I create my scaffolding. I use my superpower, you know, and this is how I, I go forth, you know. But better late than never, you know. Let's get the diagnosis now and begin to honor that part of ourselves. You know, I want to try to lean into that. But yeah, my tender heart will always say, oh, I can just imagine what a lot of those childhood and college experiences were like. And that mm -hmm. hurts, you know. Right. And that um, what you said about, you know, making it work um, in ways that you thrive. Um, that that was the whole point of my mom homeschooling us um, because kids learn so differently, you know? And I mean, in Puerto Rico, I don't think there are very many schools that she thought she wanted to put us in um, back then at least. But that's, that's the beauty of homeschooling. You know, you go at the pace of the child and you can mm -hmm. enhance the child's interests, um, areas of interest, I guess, even though, you know, you do all of like, the classes or whatever the parent chooses to do but it's um that's the thing about sometimes schools where there's there's children who just learn differently you know and mm -hmm. and so you have x amount of children in a classroom and not everyone learns at the same pace or has the same interests and so it's hard to really like make learning fun for kids and make mm -hmm. them 
love to learn. Um, so it's, um, it's, yeah, that's what homeschooling was about for us. And, and I, and I had that, I think school would have been so much harder for me because of this, because, you yes. know, I had that freedom to like, Hey, I told my mom, I, I'm really like passionate about this book right now. I really want to just finish this book, even though mm-hmm. like the deadline for it wasn't for another or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I had other subjects to focus on, but you know, I, I would finish the book and then the next day I would focus on then the math or whatever I was leaving mm-hmm. behind because I didn't want to do it. Um, mm-hmm. And so it allowed me to really love at least the subjects I loved, you know, and I, and I could yeah. just immerse myself in them. I was really motivated right now to write this, you know, book report. Um, so I had the freedom to do that, you know. Um, so, yeah, this, despite not having had, like, the diagnosis, um, I think homeschooling just did wonders for me. And also, like, you know, I stopped in the middle of what I was doing and I was like, oh, I really want to practice the violin right now. And I would go and practice, you know, mm-hmm. um, or I was like, I really don't want to practice. And I really want to read this book and I could do that. Um, and for people like who need structure, like parents, I, this might sound like a nightmare for parents who are like, no, we need <laughs> nine to five a structure, you know, mm-hmm. um, that doesn't work for every kid, honestly. So, yeah, but. no, I, that is such I'm always intrigued whenever I hear you speak about your homeschooling experience, because even if your mom did not kind of latch on to that diagnosis, there was just something that she intuited about you. And I understand that you were, you know, kind of the passionate kid, you know, in the family, which I think is a really great descriptor for someone with ADHD. Um, And that was a a fantastic workaround, really, because I mean, I think you really are brilliant. And how sad would it have been if that had been curtailed or you had gotten a bad taste in your mouth for you no know, learning means feeling bad about yourself or all, you know all of these negative things but you were really allowed to thrive in that environment mm-hmm, for sure oh yeah um I give my mom so much credit um and and another thing I remember I think we talked about at one point was um I've told you how I've always had like trouble with you know as a kid with my temper and even now like I'm just such a like emotional passionate person that Mm -hmm. my temper sometimes gets the best of me um and you did say that there are some correlations between that and ADHD right or like the lack of being able to really like control it yes so when you think like impulsivity just writ large impulsivity that's going to be in the positive you know like impulsively you get an idea I'm going to create you know, what a a new violin masterpiece. Well, you're going to all of a sudden, you know, go into that. But the same is true for kind of emotional regulation, because it's it's so much of this is an executive functioning issue, you know, of not being able to order things rightly, um, or easily, Uh, our relationship to time um, with ADHD is very, very different. So and think for moms, uh, poor moms, everything is on a clock, you know, babies have to eat, every two hours it's got to be put and and that's going to change on you so once you get that first rhythm nailed down then all of a sudden developmentally they're in a new place and that's going to change so your ability to anticipate time with adhd you think yeah sure i scrolled on my phone on facebook you know for 20 minutes this morning well no honey you didn't you did that for two and a half hours you know but awareness of that is so very different and so that impulsivity comes in emotionally you know as well there's not as much the forethought to, I need to have this uncomfortable conversation with somebody. I better think that through, wait until there's a good time, and then we can really talk about this in a controlled way. No, I see it, I think it, I feel it, I say it. You know? mm, yeah. And that yes. is really, really challenging. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah, I'm. that's me. Like, I, It feels like the end of the world if I don't get it out in the moment that I feel it. You know, there's some, like, my brain can intellectualize that it's maybe not a good time, maybe don't say it, but I'm just like, no, I need to say it. <laughs> and so yes. I'm working on that for sure. Because I, I obviously have a thinking brain up here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really trying to find ways, of, as you've mentioned, like, you know, if I'm, if my body, because my body tells me, you know, how, like, how I'm feeling. So if I feel, like, heightened, you know, maybe I can just okay, let me just go somewhere else until I feel mm-hmm. like I can say it without, you know, sounding mm-hmm. um, rude or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. In some way, just being able to get to self-control. That is like the magic, magic ticket with ADHD is not believing 
I'm therefore subject to, because I'm so passionate and because I am impulsive and all of these things, I'm just subject to being out of control. That doesn't actually feel good inside of you when you have to live in that way. Um, but being able to get from here to there is the challenge, right? Of saying, okay, so how do I strengthen that self-control muscle? Because yeah, physically, it's a very different experience. I mean, even as you describe it, I feel that like little engine starting to run inside of, it is, it is a need, it's not a desire. It feels like a need to say what needs to be said in the moment or do what needs to be done. So to resist feels almost physically painful. Right. Yeah. So in this, I guess, in this whole process of me just discovering myself through parenting, it's very unique how how you learn so much about yourself in such a short span. And you're like, oh, my gosh, there's so much healing that needs to be done. And there's so much I need to do. Um, But, you know, I don't I don't want to pass on any of like the shame or just really that generational trauma, you know, to my to my own child or children. Um, Mm -hmm. So. I'm trying to do the work to, you know, break the cycle. Um, what are ways that you, you know, I mean, I'm sure this could look so many different ways depending on the person, the trauma, whatever, but just what's some advice you can give on on how to break some of the generational trauma cycle and yeah. heal our own childhood wounds? Yeah. I mean, I think it's so just encouraging, really, and wise of you to even as a, a young mom and kind of early in the process, be really looking to that to say, hey, it's not for, um, it's never going to be a lack of love for your child or goodness of heart or any of those things that is going to cause this harm to break through. It's, it's patterns, right? It's embedded trauma. It's patterns that we live out of that unless we do something different, they will impact our kids. So I just, I think I'm so encouraged that you have an eye to that. Yeah, I think number one, that masterful word, curiosity, you know, kind of paying attention to your life. You're not trying to be a master over everything all at once, but just paying attention. So in your days, noticing, huh, where is it that I tend to lose it the most? You know, Uh, where is it that something ceases to become just kind of an area of struggling in my life and all of a sudden feels like suffering. You know, there's a jump between here and there. And and how can I kind of put an eye to that and be curious about what's going on there? And definitely so much is, okay, where have I felt this before? You know, it's that reflecting back. When do I remember experiencing this before? What was the message that I embedded? Or maybe the vow that I made to never do that or never be that, you know, and as a result, um, you kind of are imprisoned, you know, in this sort of cycle of being, that's the feeling or the belief, that's not the truth, but that's the feeling, you know, so to begin to name those things, um, we can't start by fixing them in the beginning. And, and, And one plug I think I'll say is for us, like, people who higher functioning, and we want to be intellectual, and we have all these wonderful resources of learning, I think a lot of the mistake that we make, um, particularly as moms, is, you know, we'll say, okay, well, this is how it was for me. I've named it. I can go back and I can see this is what I experienced and I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to put that into my mind and I'm going to jump all the way over here past all of the chaos and the trauma and the pain and the confusion. And I'm just going to be different over here because I've intellectualized it as such, you know. I just don't think we get that luxury as humans, you know? No, the way over here is through it. It is feeling the pain. It is understanding as best you can some of the chaos. It's in naming some of, well, what was your part in that? And what do you still tend to hold, you know, hold to? And not asking so much of yourself that you just transcend the experience and be different, but asking of yourself, will you walk through that door each day, you know, each day with curiosity and an openness and a desire for change to move towards something that is different now in your life and for your child. And, and so much of that is kind of the work that you and I talk about of reparenting, you know, reparenting yourself and your little girl, little Katya, little Mindy, um, you know, what did she need? What does she now need as an adult to understand differently about herself so that she can move in her world in new ways? Yeah. Oh, 
That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you um, for, yeah, just shedding your wisdom and light and knowledge um, with us. And, and that that's, I think, very much key, as you say, and, and, and not thinking like, not thinking that I'm a failure if I didn't like manage this today, mm -hmm. you know, um, I guess being a little more gracious with myself is kind, a big, is yes. a big one. <laughs> Being so kind, you want to model that for your little kiddos, but it starts, it's harder. It's easier to be kind to them than it is to ourselves so much of the time. But modeling that is so important. Right. And I'm all about, you know, teaching by example. So how, you know, hypocritical of me if I can't be nice to myself so that I can show her, you know, how to be kind to herself too. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, Katya too, and I want to say this to every mom out there, the gift of humor is it is just the most beautiful thing and the simplest tool that we ought to keep in our tool belts at all times to be able to laugh at ourselves i think that teaches our kids so much you know laugh with them show them laughing at yourself laughing at your gaps the other day we were talking at our table about um one of my daughters was reflecting on what side of the family she thinks she gets this or that attribute from and she thinks my mom is very fancy so she thinks she gets her fanciness from her you know this or that and so and i knew what was coming and i said and so what is it that you think you got from mom and she said well she said i like to have a lot of fun and you like to have a lot of fun and i tend to spill things a lot and i kind of think <laughs> i get that from you too <laughs> <laughs> That's and we just funny. laughed so hard and I was like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> you got that straight from me, girl. <laughs> that's I, that reminds me of my mom she's you know she complains that she's so clumsy and this and that so and that it gets worse with age you know she's like mm. I've become clumsier with the old age um well, and no, I don't I've never <laughs> right so I'm like oh, I, I people say I, I look like my mom like physically and personality wise so mm. I'll probably start spilling things any day now <laughs> mm. well laugh oh. at yourself mm. and enjoy it it's it's a free mm -hmm. free joke Thank you. Um, well, I'll conclude our session now. Um, but thank you so much, Mindy, for for just being here with us, giving us your time. Um, so until next time and anything else you would like to add? You know, I'll just say it's just such a treat to be on here. I think any mom, I'm hoping that somebody is listening to this right now while they are holding laundry or doing packing lunches, just doing some what feels like sort of menial chore, um, but able to get some joy out of just being in the uh, family, you know, being in the family of fellow strugglers that are all trying to figure this out together and no one is an expert, and no one is a guru, but if we can all stay in conversation with one another and all stay curious about our own lives and our own processes, maybe then we will be able to just kind of get one step ahead. You know, that, that's sort of the goal. Amazing. Well, Mindy Bales, everyone, thank you. Thank you so much. Good to be with you today. <laughs> bueno, mi gente, gracias, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Unapparent Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe as we release a new episode at least every month with an exciting new guest. Be sure to also follow us on Instagram for all the Unapparent content you never knew you needed. <laughs>